We'll talk more after the story. Now here's Dave Eggers reading Roddy Doyle's story, Bullfighting. He couldn't really remember life before the children. He couldn't feel it as something he'd once lived. It was too far away and buried. Something as simple as walking down the street. He was always a father, or looking at a woman. He was a father. He had one child left. There'd been four, but three of them were up and running, more or less their own men. They were all boys, still teenagers. But they weren't his anymore. Except for the youngest. That was Peter. Peter still held Donald's hand. Except when there were people coming toward them, boys or girls his own age or older. They need let go until they were around the corner. And Donald knew. One day soon he'd open his hand for Peter's and it would stay empty. And when that happened, he'd die. He'd lie down on the ground. That was how he felt. After 20 years, independence, time to himself, he didn't want it. You'll have your own life, someone had told him. I have my own life, he'd said back. I fucking like it. He'd never felt hard done by. He didn't think he had. He'd loved the life, even the stress of it. He'd be knackered tired sometimes, red-eyed and soggy, only vaguely aware that he had a name or even a gender, and still he'd think, I'm alive. Making a dinner he knew none of them would eat, or charging into Temple Street Hospital with a wheezing or a bleeding child, or standing at the side of a football pitch in the pissing rain, 20 miles from home, watching one of the boys trying to make sure that the ball didn't go anywhere near him. The boys had been the rhythm of every day, even when he was sleeping. He woke before they did, always. None of his lads had ever walked into an empty kitchen first thing in the morning. There was once he was changing a nappy. Carl's, Carl was the second. They were at Elaine's mother's place. It was a Sunday afternoon. He had Carl parked in front of him on the edge of his changing mat, his arse in the air, right over Elaine's ma's white carpet. He pulled the nappy out from under Carl and the shite jumped free of the nappy, a half-solid ball. Without thinking, Donald caught it. His hand just went out. The nappy in one hand, the shite in the other, Carl's ass hanging over the carpet. And he couldn't wait to tell everyone. He knew he had his story. The stories, 20 years of them. They already seemed stale. They'd been overlived, dragged out too often. He'd start talking, even thinking, and he'd feel the camera lights, the heat. He'd imagine he was talking to a studio audience, selling something, trying to convince them. But there was nothing dishonest about how he felt. Empty. Finished. The stories, his memories, were wearing out, and there was nothing new replacing them. His whole fucking life was going. He watched telly now with Peter, a film on Sky Movies, Little Man. It was dreadful. This tiny little black guy was pretending he was a baby. Donald didn't know why. They'd missed the start, staring at a woman's tits, trying to grab them. It was absolutely dreadful. But Peter was laughing, so he did too. Should we even be watching this, Pete? It's appropriate, said Peter. I checked. But he wants to have sex with the woman. So do you, said Peter. Okay, said Donald. Fair enough. One last story for the file. So do you, he says. Peter was ten. Donald was forty-eight. So were his friends. He liked the precision of that. All his friends were forty-eight. It was the best thing about Ireland, about Dublin anyway. He could still see the men he'd grown up with. He'd gone to school with lads who'd moved to Canada, the States, even South Africa. But no one he knew had ever moved south of the Liffey. They'd either got out of the country or stayed put and Donald had been lucky. He'd walked out of school in 1977 and straight into a job in the civil service. A few years later, the jobs weren't there, but Donald had never been out of work, and his friends were like him. They lived in houses a few miles from where they'd all grown up. They could walk to the pub. It wasn't the same place where they'd had their first pints, but that place was only two miles away. They met up once a week, all four of them or three of them or even just the two, It was an open kind of arrangement, but a bit more organized since they'd started the texting a few years back. Pub? Yeah. 9.30? Grand. Donald never felt tired on Thursday nights. He'd be away on holidays in France, say, or Portugal or Orlando in the States, having a great time. But on the Thursday, wherever, he wished he was at home on his way to the pub. 
It had always been like that. There was once, early on with Elaine, they'd been on the bed in his flat. She'd just poured a melted Mars bar into her navel, and she caught him looking at his watch. Have you got something more important to do? God, no. Fuck no. This is brilliant. The hot chocolate had burned his tongue a bit, and he'd felt a little bit sick. But it had been great. He could still remember her stomach under his tongue. This is the first thing I've eaten since me breakfast, he told her, and she laughed and he could feel that too, rippling her skin, lifting her. He'd held her, he told her this years later, he'd held her hips to keep her on her back so that none of the melted chocolate would drop onto the sheet because it was the only sheet he had and he didn't want her to know that. He ate the chocolate, cleaned it all up, and then he didn't care what way she ended up. It was up to her. His friends never talked about sex or health. They never had. Or problems. They didn't really talk about their problems. Other people didn't really get it, especially women. Grown men getting together like that as if it was weird or unnatural or a bit silly. Are you meeting the lads tonight? I'm not answering if you're going to sneer like that. Like what? The lads. She'd even asked him once when he was putting his shoes on, What use are they? What? The lads, she'd said. Your friends. What about them? Why are they your friends? I'm not answering that. Don't be so touchy, she said. I'm curious. Well, stay curious. I'm sorry, I didn't mean anything. Why do I have to defend myself? You don't. I have to explain why my friends are my friends? Why the fuck should I? Don't, if you don't want to. I never ask you about your friends, he said. I know, she said. You don't even know their names. I do. She smiled. I do, he insisted. There's Mary and... Stop, she said. Listen, I suppose what I'm wondering is, what do you talk about? He looked at her. Football, he said. He knew she'd hate the answer. Is that all? No. What else, she said. Help me here. He didn't know what else to give her. He didn't know how to explain it. How what they talked about wasn't important how they could sit and say nothing much for much of the night, and he'd still come home feeling great. Appreciated. Jokes, he said. You tell jokes. Yeah, he said, if we've heard any new ones. That's nice. She wasn't sneering. Mind you, he said, you never hear jokes these days. It's all email stuff. No one makes up jokes anymore. Like stories, you know? She nodded. Can I go now, he said. Go on. He was the first in. Their usual table was free. He nodded at the barman, raised one finger. He always liked that. The fact that he could order a pint without talking. He'd been coming here for years. The barman was Polish. He'd only been working here for three months or so, but he knew what Donald's order was, and Donald had never had to tell him. The Poles were great. He sat and looked at the snooker on the telly. He hadn't a clue who was playing. He didn't know either of the players. They looked younger than his older kids, hair gel and little rectangular ads stitched onto their waistcoats. They looked too young to be out in the world on their own, millionaires already, more than likely. He was out of touch. He knew it. The lounge girl came up with his pint in the center of her tray. Thanks, said Donald. Of course. She was Lithuanian, as far as Donald remembered, or Latvian, a lovely young one, lovely attitude. He gave her a tenor. She gave him his change, and he gave her back some of it. Thank you. You're grand. Donald felt the draft and saw Jerry closing the door behind him. The lounge girl was waiting. Will you like another pint of Guinness? Great, yeah, thanks. He felt a bit uncomfortable with her. She was a woman and a girl. That was the problem, and the attraction, and the problem. He'd have been happier with a lounge boy. Fucking cold out there, said Jerry. This was how it happened. They arrived in a clump from one man to four inside a minute or two, as if they'd been hiding behind the bushes outside until one of them made the move and went in. Or something, an instinct, told the four of them to get up from the telly and go, at the same time, every Thursday. Donald watched the other two, Ken and Sean, wrap the wires around their iPods and put them into their jacket pockets. He decided again he'd get an iPod. What were you listening to, he asked. Springsteen, said Ken. The new album? Yep. 
Any good? His best since the last one. The young one brought the pints. Donald paid her and tipped her again. He'd given her four euros for one round. It made him feel seedy and generous. They'd have four pints. They might go to five. Four was automatic. The fifth was always a decision. It used to be more. They used to drink all day, days in a row, weekends drunk, into work on Monday, drunk. Donald and Jerry had gone 24 hours once, in Mallorca. They'd found a bar that would let them drink till daylight. They'd had breakfast, traditional English breakfast, on the way back to the apartment. He remembered being surprised that he could hold the knife and fork. Sean looked around. How many in here would you say have snorted cocaine? None, said Jerry. He was probably right. Not according to the news, said Sean. We're all fucking snorting. I've never even seen cocaine, said Jerry. Have any of you? They shook their heads. Some young one, a model, had died, and two other kids in Wexford or Waterford, they'd eaten damp cocaine. The radio was full of it, and the television. Middle-class men, their faces fuzzy and their voices disguised, describing their cocaine hells. It's on the cheese board, every dinner party I've been to and hidden cameras and pub toilets, more fuzzy faces, leaning over cisterns with rolled-up euros. What about your kids, said Ken. They all had kids, teenagers and older. Donald shrugged. Don't know, he said. Don't think so. How do you know? I don't, said Donald, but I think I would. Jerry nodded. How would we know, he said, unless they went crazy or something. A swab, said Sean. What? A swab of the cistern or a shelf for traces of cocaine. They laughed. Three of them laughed. You couldn't do that in my house, said Jerry. The jacks is never empty. I did, said Sean. They looked at him. They stared at him. You did a a what? A test? A fucking swab? Yep, said Sean. Did you get a kit or something? Jerry asked him. Do you not have to be a fucking forensics expert or something? Not at all, said Sean. All you need is a cotton bud. I ran one across the top of the jacks, the cistern-like. And? It was filthy. They laughed again. White particles, said Sean. Dust, said Donnell. Talc. The jacks would be full of it. Any room. The air's full of dust. Did you have to have them tested? The white particles? No, said Sean. So, said Jerry. What did you prove? I sniffed the bud, said Sean. Snorted it, like, so to speak. And? I was high as a fucking kite. He was joking. Dancing with the fridge. Seriously, though, he said. I've been watching my girls since it got into the news, and they're the same as they've ever been. So they either aren't using cocaine or they've always been using cocaine. He shrugged. They're grand, he said. The only one that might be snorting is Maeve. Maeve was his wife. Do you reckon? It would explain quite a lot, said Sean. He left it at that. They didn't talk about the wives. They drifted from cocaine to football and onto the film that Jerry had seen at the weekend and the others wanted to see. How was Denzel? Brilliant. And on to international affairs. Poor old Benazir. What a place. Mad. Would you have given her one? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Too late now, anyway. She was a fine thing. I liked her headscarf. That's the thing, though, said Donald. Women don't wear them here anymore. Not even at mass. They'll make a comeback, said Ken. Wait and see. Abercrombie and Fitch or somebody will bring back the headscarf. Benazir, but, said Jerry, she was a lot better looking than any of the women politicians in this country. That's for sure. What about Hillary Clinton? No. A few years back, maybe. Not now, though. She'd be saying the same thing about us. She hasn't a clue. Would you ride Obama? Not unless he was a woman. I have a dream. That was the night the idea was planted. They'd go away together, to Spain. The four of us? Why not, said Jerry. Sounds good. Jerry's brother had a place down there. Where? Valencia. Near there, a half hour or so, inland. No sand or shite. It's great. There was no decision that night, nothing firm. Donald said nothing to Elaine about it. He waited for Jerry to bring it up the next Thursday. Did you give any more thought to that? What? said Ken. Spain. Your brother's gaff? Yeah. They looked at one another and shrugged and smiled. Well, I'm going, said Jerry. Grand. 
They went a few weeks after Easter, a Ryanair flight to Valencia, then a hired car. Donald had driven in France, but in his own car. They'd always got the ferry. They'd been to France four times, always the same place, camping. The last time was five years ago. The year after that, the eldest, Matthew, said he wouldn't go. They couldn't make him. He was 15, and he was too young to leave behind. They drove into the town. It seemed deserted and a bit ugly. Is this the siesta? Suppose so. It was early afternoon. Jerry parked outside a bar. There's people in there, so they're not all asleep. They sat outside with four bottles of beer that cost the same as one bottle at home. Sean took off his jumper. That's it, lads. I'm on me holidays. Good man. How far is the house? Three minutes. Grand. This is fucking great, said Donald. But he was disappointed. It was great, a week away from everything, but the town itself was shite. It was dead. Their table was on a street, but it didn't matter because the street was empty. He sat up and looked properly. What's that? What? The wall down there, the curved wall. The bull ring, said Jerry. For bullfighting? Yeah. Serious? Yeah. Great. No, said Jerry. It's a pain in the hole. Boring. Still, though, said Donald. Do they kill the bulls? Yeah. Cool. They, like, release them first, said Jerry. Let them run through the streets. And that's fucking boring, is it? said Sean. It is, said Jerry. Believe me. Still, though, said Donald. It's the fiesta, said Jerry, the annual festival, St. Supton, or the Virgin Mary. They slaughter bulls for the Virgin Mary? Wait till you see it later, said Jerry. It's good. The fiesta bit. He stood up. They got back in the car. Jerry took them out of the town, past a field full of solar panels, and behind a small industrial estate. In Dublin, this is where you dump the body or the fridge. Here it was a row of flat-roofed houses under palm trees. Here we are. It was the last house in the row. Jerry got out and unlocked the gate. They got out and followed him. They saw the pool, but kept behind Jerry as he got the front door open and walked into the hot, dead air. Fucking hell. They hoisted the shutters and opened all the windows. There weren't many. It wasn't a big house. They threw bags on the beds, and then they went out to the pool. It's nice and clean. There's a chap keeps an eye on it for Declan. Declan was Jerry's brother. He throws in the chlorine and scoops out the flies in that. What's that? There was a white machine, like a fat pup with a trunk, moving very slowly along the bottom. It's a hoover, said Jerry. For fuck's sake, is it on all the time? Think so, yeah. Clever. It's useless, said Jerry. If it's the same one, it just moves into a corner and stays there. So the corner's spotless and the rest of it gets covered in fucking goo. They got into the togs and sat looking at the water and, one at a time, they got in, because there wasn't really room for more than one man, the way they swam. They sat with their backs to the industrial estate and let themselves get hungry. They chatted and kept an eye on the sun. The watches were off, thrown onto the beds. They had one more swim, then showered and put on the shorts and t-shirts. The shorts were new. They never wore shorts at home. Is that a bruise? Varicose vein. Lovely. You can show it to whatever young one you pick up tonight in town. I'll tell you, show a bird your varicose veins and she'll be on you like a fucking barnacle. They waited till Jerry locked the gate. Dogs, he said, have to keep them out. What, said Donald, wild? Kind of. Jesus. It's the one bad thing, said Jerry, the way they treat the dogs. And now they could hear them. Dogs howling, baying, whatever it was. Are they all wild? No, said Jerry, just fucking miserable. Jerry showed them the lane that would get them to town. They walked, all four men in a row. The sandals slapped the dust. They went past the industrial estate and the tied-up dogs. What gets made in there? Nothing, as far as I know. Distribution? Maybe, but I've never seen a truck. Who feeds the dogs? There's an automatic feeder. It releases enough food every day. And water. They all have them. Most of the houses are empty during the week. That's terrible. Talking about feeders, said Donald. I'm fucking starving. They all were. A few scoops, a game of pool, and the nose bag. How's that for a plan? They ignored the bullfighting. It was on the telly, a local channel, in the bar. And it was outside. 
There were people running down the street and back up the street, and a marching band somewhere. Donald wanted to have a look, but Jerry was the local, and he didn't even look out the window. And fair enough, it all looked shite on the telly. There was a bull standing still outside a church, it looked like, and young lads, all young lads, were walking carefully up to it and touching it and dashing back. It looked like something anyone could do. The young lads all wore red T-shirts, trying to provoke the bull, he supposed. But the bull wasn't having any of it. He just stood there, still. Then he was gone, off the screen, in the time it took Donald to bend down at the table and pretend he was sizing up his shot. He hadn't a clue, really. The commentator was going mad, but all Donald could see was the door of the church. They finished the game and went walking. The excitement was still in the street, the young lads bashing against one another, thumping their chests. There was no sign of the bull, although there was dung in the air and, Donald saw it now, blood on the street. A topic for the phone call home in the morning. The marching band was still marching, but they still hadn't seen it. There were stalls down both sides of the main street, and Donald saw some of the stuff he'd bring home, the small presents the kids used to charge down the hall for, when they saw him coming in the door after he'd been away for a day or two because of work. They found a place and ate well, good big steaks. Straight off the fucking bull. The waiter recognized Jerry, smiled at him. Irish, yes? Yeah, good man. How are you? said the waiter. Good, said Jerry. Yeah, how's business? You are my business. He clapped his hands. Business is good. They stopped at another bar, another few drinks at a table outside. The loud young lads were gone. There were families strolling, proud men pushing buggies. It's after one. A different world. It's very civilized. If this was Dublin, we'd be watching the fight. We'd be at home. They walked back to the house at about three. A swim? Don't be fucking stupid. They slept through the dogs. The room was still dark when Donald woke. But there was a day outside. He could feel it pressing against the shutter. He got out of the bed and he was grand. No bother. He went out to the hall and looked at his phone. One o'clock. He'd woken up in the afternoon. He couldn't remember the last time that had happened. Long before kids, before marriage. He went out to the pool and Jerry was there, listening to his iPod. Donald sat beside him. What are you listening to? The Cure. The Cure? Are they still good? They're great. Hang on. I can link this up to the speakers inside. It'll wake the other pair up. He went inside and, a minute later, Donald was listening to the Love Cats. Jerry came back with a pot of good, solid coffee. The other two got up. They chatted. They swam. They read. They ate some bread and cheese. They got bored with the cure, so Jerry changed it to Echo and the Bunnymen. Donald was definitely getting an iPod. He'd forgotten these bands had existed. Do you remember Japan? Uh, they haven't aged well. Have they not? What about madness? Kids love madness. I love madness. Talking heads? They're next. The sun started dipping and Sean came out with four bottles of Stella. That was their week in Spain, their routine, like heaven in the Talking Heads song, where nothing ever happened. The songs were queuing up. He rang home every day, walked around the pool while he talked to Elaine and Peter and the older boys if they were at home. He texted them, too. How are things? They usually got back to him, grand or good or fine. You? But he didn't really miss them. He didn't think about them. He didn't ache to hold them as they used to be, their weight in his arms, their smells under his nose. He didn't mind being alone in the bed when he woke. He liked it, just himself, nothing to remember or catch up on. He stopped hearing the dogs. The three lads were up before him one of the mornings. Jerry was walking around the pool, worrying the hoover with the butt of a brush, pushing it out toward the center. Ken had his blackberry, was poking away at it with a little plastic stick. He put it on the table. There now, he said. That should keep the economy afloat. Day's work done? And no one even knows I'm here. This is the world we live in, men. Ken had rigged his life so that where he actually was rarely mattered. And Jerry was the same. Jerry and Ken had slid into self-employment about 15 years before. Donald hadn't noticed, too busy changing nappies. And he was happy enough where he was, in the revenue. He still liked it, going after the farmers. He'd found bogus accounts and all sorts of hidden accounts. 
Hairy men with shite on their boots with millions stashed away in the Caymans and Bermuda or in biscuit tins under their beds. A few years back, he'd been asked into an office for a chat. Had he ever thought of the CAB? He must have looked a bit slack-jawed because the man in a better suit than Donald's provided a word for each of the letters. Criminal Assets Bureau? Would you be up for it? Are they not the guards, said Donnell, cops, going after gangsters? It's liquid, said his boss's boss. You'd be on secondment. And now you wouldn't be breaking down doors or anything like that. It wouldn't be the untouchables. Will you think about it anyway? We wouldn't be asking if we didn't think you were the man they needed. Thanks. You'll think about it? Yeah, he said. I will. I'll leave it with you. He didn't tell Elaine. He told no one. He was flattered, thrilled. He actually saw himself in the part. He felt the door give way against his shoulder, felt the weight of the shotgun, felt, saw. His eyes matched the look coming at him from the drug baron across the room. They never came back to him about it, but that didn't matter. He couldn't have gone to work knowing that Elaine or the kids were worried about him. He didn't think it was just an excuse or a lie. He didn't think it then. He wasn't sure. It was six or seven years ago. Six, and actually he was sure. He'd wanted nothing to do with gangland warlords or major drug dealers. He was happier with the farmers. Jerry had always been a bit more daring or mad. Donald could see him now. He rolled. He multitasked. He scooped the dead stuff out of the pool with a net while he sold a guy in Dublin an insurance policy or something. An update, Jerry called it. You're what, said Jerry, to the phone? Fifty-two? Now he was shoving the hoover back to the middle of the pool. It's not about the years you've left, Mick, he said. He was wearing a Red Hot Chili Peppers t-shirt, nearly faded to nothing. One of his kids, Donald guessed. It's about the years you've already lived, he said. What do you have to show for them? What there is to protect? Are you with me? He sat down and picked up one of the bottles. It's not going to get cheaper because you've less years to live. It's insurance I'm selling, not milk. And look, I'm not even selling it. You're already well covered. I'm just telling you about it. I have to. It's the law. He took a swig from the bottle. Spain, he said. Yeah, it's great. Just me and a few lads. No, no golf. Fuck golf. You know about me and golf. So anyway, Grant, there's no hurry. You phone me, Mick. Either way. Yeah, I will. Yeah, good luck. He put the phone on the table. He said nothing. It was just work, the way he did it now. What he used to do at a desk or in a pub or a restaurant five years ago. He'd adjusted. He could work beside a swimming pool in Spain with his best friends. The world, said Ken, one of the nights they were out. What about it? It's grand, said Ken, but I worry a bit sometimes. Why? Not about global warming or that, said Ken. That'll sort itself out. There'll be good and bad there. They nodded. They all kind of agreed, and none of them wanted to talk about global warming. They were wearing shorts and sandals. It was boring. Just, said Ken, the future, like, I've complete faith in us, our age group, and the very young, kids, like. Donald knew what he meant. It's the ones in between, he said. And Ken nodded. Exactly, he said. Do you know many people in their thirties? One or two, said Sean. Fucking idiots, said Ken. Every one of them. I'm right, aren't I? Yeah, said Donald. But you're right about kids as well. They're brilliant. They were talking shite, enjoying themselves, but still in all, Donald nearly cried. He was talking about his own kids. Moving away from him, setting off on their own. He loved it and hated it. He'd never get over it, but he'd have to. Jerry looked at him. Are you all right? He said, quietly. I'm grand, said Donald. And he was. They'd never talk about it, except agree and move on. The day before they left for home, they went into Valencia. They got up in time to catch the bus. Past half-built apartment blocks and wasteland, no real countryside, and no sea. They yawned and chatted till Jerry stood up, and they followed him off the bus. They wandered around for a couple of hours. They went into the cathedral. Donald put 50 cents in a slot and watched the electric candles come on. He walked away before they went off again. They went to an old market, the Plaza Redonda, and decided not to buy any bootleg DVDs because they didn't want to carry them around all day and lose them. They went into a tapas place and ate about 50 euros worth of the little things along the counter. They went to a bar with a big screen to watch the English football. 
They had their first beers slowly and a few more slowly till the match was over and they went for a stroll. They found a small corner bar with a very good-looking waitress and they stayed there till it was dark. They talked more than they had all week, got pissed slowly, enjoyed the fact that they knew that they were getting pissed. They couldn't come back from the jacks without slapping a back. The talk got a bit mad. The first ride, the best ride, the weirdest, the longest. Four minutes. Four and a half. Good man. Ever with another man? No. No way. Ever curious? No, not really. Ever with a relation? Does it have to be a blood relation? Yeah. Then no. Who but? Her ma. Your mother-in-law? Yeah. You're jesting. I'm not. You are. Yeah, I am. But it was touch and go. At her da's funeral, you know, back at the house. They were the only ones laughing in the bar. They left and moved on to another one. David Bowie and another good-looking waitress. Donald told them about the job in the CAB. They told him he'd been right not to take it. They all told him that. They had more tapas in another place. Sean told Donald that his marriage was on the rocks. Jerry told Donald that his marriage was on the rocks. Donald told Jerry that his own had been rocky for a while, but that things were grand now, much better. Then he told Sean and Ken. Then they were in a taxi heading back to town, laughing. Three of them squashed into the back, Jerry in the front beside the driver. It was three in the morning. There was still a bar open, the one just down from the bullring. Ken went in, came back out with four bottles. They sat. They heard the marching band. It might have been a different band. They still hadn't seen it. At this time, said Sean, the town that never sleeps. Donald stood up. He left his bottle on the table. He'd had enough. He wanted the bed. He walked. There was some sort of action going on at the bullring. The exit gates were open. It was lit inside. He could see people, lots of young lads, standing in the ring. There was a barrier between him and the ring like the metal bars of a jail. The bars were wide enough apart for people to get through, but he supposed, solid enough to stop a bull. He went in sideways between two of the bars. He walked into the ring. It was quiet. He couldn't hear the band, but the seats all around seemed full. A double gate at the other side was wide open, but he couldn't see anything beyond it. The young lads were just standing there. He heard an engine, a truck, a big one, reverse slowly through the double gates. Lads got out of the way. A man in a black t-shirt jumped out of the cab and went to the back of the truck. There was another man there with him. They lowered the tailgate. Donald heard chains and a rumble, and they stood back. The crowd roared, and he saw the bull charge down the ramp, then stop, dead still, like the bull on a wine bottle, black and huge and still. The young lads didn't move any nearer, but no one ran. Donald moved a step closer. The truck was leaving, slowly, he watched till it was gone and the double gates were shut behind it. The bull had moved. Not much, he didn't think. The angle was different, turned more toward Donald. Then the strange thing happened. A man with a burning torch, Donald hadn't seen him arrive, walked right up to the bull and set fire to it. The two horns were on fire. Red flames roared over its head. There was a hand on Donald's shoulder. You might want to step back a bit. It was Jerry. Yeah, said Donald. Behind the barrier, yeah. He looked behind him. He'd gone farther than he'd thought. He hadn't thought at all. He was turning away when the bull moved. Fucking Jesus. It ran, dashed, in a broken stop-start, fast. Every move covered distance. They wouldn't have had a hope. But it didn't come at them. It went across the ring, then away and out a different gate that Donald hadn't seen. The horns three times higher because of the flames. It was gone just as Donald realized he was falling. His chest hit the ground, his chin. He felt grit in his hands. But he was fine, standing up again, grand. He felt his chin. The ring was empty. Where's he gone? There was no blood in his mouth. He rubbed his hands clean. They went out to the street. There was no sign of the bull. Or anything, really. It was over. That was great, said Donald. Fucking great. What he'd just seen. What he'd just done. I didn't know they set fire to the poor fuckers as well, said Sean. Why do they? Fuck no, said Jerry. It's mad. They walked to the house. One more beer, out at the pool. Jerry stuck on the music. Donald held the bottle against his chin. The way the bull had stood absolutely still. 
He put the bottle on the table. Then the movement, across the ring, the speed, the flames. He went over to the pool. The feeling he'd had, before the bull moved, not caring, but knowing he was safe. It hadn't felt stupid. He puked into the pool, on his knees, straight in. Echo and the bunnymen, the dogs howling. There was no more. He lay down. He could hear the hoover under the water. Jerry was beside him. Feeling better? Sorry. No bother. How do you get vomit out of the water? Don't worry about it. We'll throw in a bucket of chlorine. That should fix it. It'll eat it or something. Jerry was sitting beside him. All right? Grand, said Donald. Thanks. No bother. A great day, said Donald, wasn't it? Yeah, said Jerry. Brilliant. Brilliant. He lay there for a while longer, his face on his arm. He felt good, clear. He'd get up in a minute. He might finish the bottle. He was fine. Fucking brilliant. This was living, he thought. This was happiness. That was Dave Eggers reading Roddy Doyle's story, Bullfighting, which was published in the magazine in 2008. It's also the title story in his collection from 2011, which is published by Viking. So, Dave, at the beginning of this story, um, Doyle writes about fatherhood as this kind of all-encompassing commitment that's completely at the center of this man's identity. Can you think of other men who've written about parenthood this way? It It seems much more common to me to read women who write about this kind of intense attachment to children. I think it's a generational shift for sure. I think that a lot more men now pull their weight at home or make a heroic effort to do that. And accordingly, they get really attached to uh, their kids and get into every aspect of child rearing. And so you look at stuff from 50 years ago, and it's mostly about men leaving their families, I think. Right. Or there's a whole lot of that. So I think it's a pretty positive shift. Yeah. And uh, and Roddy does it here in a way that's not self-congratulatory or doesn't overthink it. It's really just a guy that enjoys being around his kids. And... Um, talks about other people saying, oh, you're going to love your independence. And he's like, you know, I I felt good about being a dad the whole way yeah. through. And I think that the way he sort of shrugs that off is, I think, very real. And I think a lot of people will identify with that. So in this story, instead of the man leaving the family, the family is sort of on the verge of leaving this man. And he's thrown back on on his friendships, in a sense. Well, his identity is tied to, yeah, his role as a dad. I think that this is a guy who doesn't necessarily walk into a room and say, I'm a guy that collects taxes for the government. I think he says, I'm a guy from this town, from this neighborhood, and I'm a dad. And it's central to his identity. The other thing that, that Roddy does so well here is depict male friendship. And he's, he's this kind of poet of male camaraderie, which I think he shows mostly through the dialogue. How do you think that he gets that across so strongly in these kind of abbreviated snippets of conversation. I don't think there's anybody alive that's better at dialogue than Roddy Doyle, and I think that was maybe one of the first things that attracted me to his work, is that he doesn't make a conversation into a long, ornate mess, (laughs) I think, and sometimes (laughs) we're tempted to do that. He actually writes dialogue, and it reads at the speed of actual conversation, and it gives it a buoyancy and, and a levity that is central to his work even though the language itself in the dialogue is pretty everyday. He doesn't give them words that they wouldn't actually say in a pub. He doesn't have them make incredible insights when they're three, four beers in. And um, I don't know how often a bunch of guys drinking beer and, and watching a game say incredibly brilliant or insightful things. It's pretty yeah, rare. Yeah, yeah. So I think that when you just let them make a joke about what it would be like to uh, have relations with your mother-in-law or whatever. Like every so often, (laughs) he usually ends these conversations on some sort of joke, and then he'll move on. Right. You know, again, it gives it a a nice, truthful rhythm. That sort of abbreviation that you get in the dialogue carries over in the the rest of the story, and we get the sense of these characters. It comes together with just very few strokes of the brush. There are just these little details that we get, just knowing that they listen to The Cure or Echo and the Bunnymen while they're on holiday sitting by the pool, 
gives us some quite strong, solid sense of them. Roddy has a very interesting, intense relationship to the small detail. Yeah, and you hear these guys are selling insurance and collecting taxes and doing whatever else, and they seem like not incredibly glamorous jobs. And the easy thing to do would be to assume that these guys are all boring, buttoned-up automatons. But, of course, they were guys that were standing in the front row at Echo and the Bunnymen or would know every word of Red Hot Chili Peppers' uh, early work, etc. And um, so I think that you get a sense that, you know, they look back on those years fondly, but they moved into their 30s and 40s with not resignation, but contentment. Yeah, it's funny because I, I read the, the Guardian's review of the story collection, Bullfighting, and it absolutely presents, you know, Doyle's heroes as men who are in the midst of midlife angst. There's actually a quote, you know, their past suddenly seems very distant, the future slightly dark, and the present incomprehensible. Hmm. And to me, that completely missed the point. I mean, I, I absolutely believe that these men are really happy. You don't think I'm wrong? Yeah, I don't. I, you know, I, I think that Roddy does mean that these guys are happy and they can be confronted with youth and confronted with the untamed, feral, unknown of youth that the bull and the bull ring represent. But he's just as happy to leave that, walk down the street and go to sleep with his three buddies in the, uh, rented condo right with the dogs barking in the distance and all these other symbols of wildness i think right. he's uh, quite content to be swimming in the little pool with his buddies and their t-shirts and their beers mm -hmm. yeah i mean obviously there's a little irony in that last line having having someone who's just thrown up in the pool say this this was happiness but at the same time yeah i agree i think he really thinks it's happiness and feels it's happiness. And I, it's such a tough line to walk in fiction between understanding characters and condescending to them. And I think one of the things that Roddy does so well is absolutely avoid that condescension. Oh, yeah. You'll never see it in anything he's ever written as far as I've read. And I think I've read everything. He believes in his characters. His empathy for everyone in every story is pretty profound and... Um, and the last thing you'd see is some story about four guys and the author hates all four of them. You know, like I, <laughs> I never understand the point in sitting down to write about characters you don't like. But um, obviously Roddy invests incredible humanity and warmth and just reality and truth into every character he writes. And he has a way of getting into anybody's skin. And he's written about all kinds of uh, people in modern Ireland and the more... You know, immigrants come to Ireland, and the more that Ireland's face changes, he's right there with it. On that subject, do you place Roddy in the sort of Irish tradition, Irish literary tradition? You know, do you think there's anything of Joyce or, or Beckett in his work, or is he, does he kind of emerge from this unified Europe? I don't think you could separate him from Ireland. I think he's the quintessential contemporary Irish writer. And there are lots of great writers from modern Ireland. But he's my tie to contemporary Ireland. He's sort of everything that I feel I, I know about the soul of modern Ireland. I think I learned through Roddy. And um, it's important to me because my heritage is 90% Irish. And um, I feel like he helps explain things to me and keeps me somewhat tied to uh, whatever heritage I might be grasping at. He's got the sense of humor that I think that we like to associate with our Irish heritage, I think he's got the, the passion and the sense of music. And he's been able to, better than anybody, I think, describe the ups and downs of the last 15 years in Ireland. You have his earlier stories that are from a very different Ireland than we knew during the boom. And now he's back, when Ireland's back on its heels a little bit, he's right there talking about what life is like in the lives of the people that live it after the crash. So I think that He's an indispensable voice. I mean, you know, sentimentality is, is something of a bugbear in fiction these days, at least. Do you think of Roddy as a sentimental writer? No, I had never thought about that. How is that defined, sentimental? Is that defined as a bad thing? Uh, well, it seems to be most of the time. But for, for me, there's so much sentiment in his writing. Hmm. 
there's always just a sort of underlying current of, of strong emotion. Oh, okay. So emotion and sentiment. But when we say emotion, that's considered good. But then sentiment is... <laughs> yes, and sentiment is Sentiment is kind yeah. of the... Yeah. Uh, I suppose it's just the, the, the fact that these stories often do have contentment and, and happiness in them. Yeah. And, and that seems to scare off a lot of fiction writers. Huh. Well, then you got to get rid of Chekhov, for sure. you got to get <laughs> rid of a lot of people if you get rid of uh, sort of contentment and emotion, you know, in the small moments in life, right? I think yeah. uh, if it's true, it's true. It doesn't all have to push 11 on the volume scale every time. And, and I, I guess, yeah, when people mean sentiment, I guess they mean sort of a treacly version of emotion or something that's too mm-hmm. tidy or... Or cute, or something like that. Is that what that they yeah, mean? I yeah. I have never heard that uh, attached to Rowdy's work, and I think it's a thousand miles from what he does, which right. is uh, a real kind of incredibly deft truth telling that has the veneer of levity, but at the core, it, I think he's writing the history of contemporary Ireland better than anybody else. Well, thank you, Dave. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me.